POV. You're the new farrier of departed souls, and your goal is to help them achieve peace and take them to... beyond. I played this game a couple of months ago, and I have not been able to stop thinking about it. So, also, it's free on Netflix and it's fun. So welcome to Spirit Fair, a beautiful game that is just... Had me thinking that this game was kind of like the bathhouse from Spirited Away, but it's something else entirely. So your name is Stella. You've woken up in the afterlife with your cat daffodil, and also you have a big hat. I'm gonna be borrowing it for a little bit to give you full immersion. Anyway, you're on your afterlife boat and there are so, so many things to do. There's fish to fish, recipes to create, ingredients to find, ore to pick, dragons to fight, jellyfish and fireflies and shades and comets and there's a lot to do. And the soundtrack? Mm. The heart of this game is saying goodbye, so even though there are some heavy hitting moments, you can't really say it's a surprise. What you don't anticipate, however, is how cute and complicated and charming all the characters are. They're these cute little animals who know you and who teach you and who tell you all about their own colorful little backstories as you learn more about them. Like, what they like, what they dislike, what they like to eat, what they refuse to eat, and which passengers they don't like, that kind of thing. An interesting aspect of this game is that all of these characters know Stella, know you, from the lives that they had before they ended up in this afterlife. And there's just something so sweet about being greeted by these funny and affectionate friends who hold you in such high regard. Some of my favorites include Summer, this little garden snake, or Tool, your uncle who's also a giant frog who likes playing his flute in the rain. These little critters are so cute and you just want to hug them. And you can. Hugging is a mechanic in this game to keep your passengers happy. And anything that has hugging as a mechanic in the game, it's a winner in my book. You can upgrade your ship and you can garden and there's all kinds of actually resources that you can have on your ship. You can make rooms that are customized to each of the passengers' likes and dislikes. And if you're lucky, you'll see your passengers actually interacting with each other, playing their little instruments together like they're some ragtag little band. And for a time, everything seems like you're just this family adventuring the seas and exploring and finding different islands. Also, did I mention that this game is 2D animated? All of your motion is smooth, but dynamic, if that makes any sense. Overall, the look of this game is very easy on the eyes. But then there comes a time to say goodbye. Both in-game and in real life, there always comes a time to say goodbye. And you can try to put it off if you want. And when a spirit asks you to take it to the Everdoor, you can actually say no and ignore it and then kind of continue on your merry way. But the game is designed that you have to say goodbye at some point in order to proceed on with your game. Plus, you can tell that's what the spirit really wants. They're ready to move on and it's your literal job to help them do so. So you accompany them to the end. You row out with them to the Everdoor where it's quiet and you have one last conversation with them. Sometimes after you take a passenger to the Everdoor, you end up in this Aurora Borealis type level where Stella gently plays the guitar and you see moments of her life from before this afterlife. And then you hear this kind of ominous music and then you, you see this owl. More on him in a bit. Something I've come to appreciate about this game is how complicated grief can be. Each passenger brings about different baggage, different emotions. There are some that you might not feel anything when they leave. And there are some where you might feel contempt. You're like put off from the character because of the things that they have done while they've been with you. But your job is your job and your job is to say goodbye. Except sometimes you don't want to and sometimes you don't get to. And ironically um, that was as far as I got into the script for this video when my father suddenly died. So where do we go from here? Well, I think I'm going to tell you about all the characters because they have a pretty big impact on the story. And then we'll talk about the whole dead dad of it all and how things have changed a lot for me. Here and out there are huge spoilers for Spirit Fair, so I'd recommend if you haven't played it to play it. And I'd recommend the Farewell Edition if you can, because there's just more content that way. And yeah. Let's try this again. So your name is Stella and you are dying. You've woken up in this otherworldly limbo purgatory type place and your job is now to help spirits 
cross over to whatever is on the other side. Except all the spirits already know you because they were really important people in your life that you had one well, before you woke up in this place. You enter different zones and lands inside this the world, and you escort friends and family members and others to the Everdoor. According to the official art book, and once a spirit has gone through the Everdoor, they leave behind a spirit flower, which has a lot of the lore for this game. They played around with the idea of collecting a little memento from each of the spirits and then having that maybe on a shelf somewhere, but they ended up scrapping it because they thought the idea was kind of tacky. But you don't keep the flowers. In fact, you have to use the flowers in order to upgrade your boat and move on through the game. I like to think that it's the game's way of cementing the idea that these people are truly gone. You also unlock memories of your life and meet the owl. While certain characters have timelines that are resolved much sooner than others, there's technically no official order to which you will meet and or say goodbye to all of your passengers, so I'm going to be covering it in the rough order that I did it. And because each of the characters give us a better idea of the timeline of Stella and who she was as a person, this and Stella's story is kind of going to be intertwined. So first there's Gwen. Gwen is Stella's dear childhood friend and the first spirit that you meet in the game. Gwen's aristocratic parents had been longtime family friends of Stella's parents. Let's call them the Stellartons, why don't we? Gwen comes off as kind of snobby at first, but her obvious soft spot for Stella gives us, the players, an in to really appreciate her as a character. Gwen's most fraught relationship was with her father. He was proud of her, but only so much as he could brag about it and self-aggrandize. To kind of get back at him, Gwen ended up taking up smoking when she was a young teenager but never quite worked up the courage to actually smoke in front of him. Her father ended up leaving Gwen and her mother, and almost despite him, he, she became a very successful fashion designer. Until one day when her father's boyfriend had called her and told her that he was dead, robbing Gwen of the closure that she so desperately needed. She continued with her career until about her mid-40s, when she was diagnosed with stage 4 lung cancer. She had gone to her childhood home with the intention of ending her life, but Stella convinced her not to, and Stella was by her side until she passed away. The minigame that Gwen introduces involves you, Stella, running headfirst into swarms of jellyfish. I've read a lot of interesting theories about what the jellyfish themselves could represent. Like, they kind of look like an MRI of what the tumor must have looked like in her lungs, like the black masses with these little bits of light in it. Maybe it's a metaphor. You know, jellyfish are dangerous, you're not supposed to touch them. And in the game, you have to run straight forward and touch them to make them burst and get their bright jelly. And that could represent how Gwen is afraid to have close relationships with people because of the relationship she had with her father. She actually kind of mentions this in her final monologue. Gwen's spirit flower is a asphodel, which represents a couple of different things depending on which flower language you're using. In Greek mythology, they represent the underworld, as the Asphodel Meadows are a section of some souls go, ordinary souls go, after they passed on. Victorian flower language, the Asphodel says, my regrets follow you to the grave. Likely representative of Gwen's regret about what she had with her father, and the regret that she has that they never reconciled. The four levels of jellyfish swarm correspond to the four stages of Gwen's lung cancer and the jellyfish themselves are an unfortunate coincidental association, as she happens to have been stung by one on the day of her first diagnosis in Stella's presence. Astrid and Giovanni. Like many of the characters in this game, Astrid and Giovanni based off the, the real-life grandparents for the creative director of this game. Well, I'm meeting them by chance. They basically become her grandparents, the grandparents that Stella never had. Astrid is represented by Regal Lynx, and she had a pretty cool life. She ended up hiding children in her mother's restaurants during World War II. She actually hit a Nazi in the face with a frying pan. She eventually had divorced him, moved on and remarried, but she always loved Giovanni still. She was at his deathbed when he did end up passing away. And when it was her time, after living to a very old age, she passed away with Stella by her side. Astrid is among the strongest, most independent characters that you meet in this So between that and her vulnerability when she's talking about Giovanni and their relationship. It's just one of the many great examples of writing complex, interesting characters. Mwah. Astrid's spirit flower is a mallow. According to the art book, this represents how much she became consumed by love. 
and the Victorian language is much in the same vein. They believed it was a sign of weakness instead of strength. Uh, being swept away in the passion of loving someone, being consumed by the feelings of the moment. But there's still others that see it as a symbol of healing or survival in tough conditions. I think both, but particularly the latter, are appropriate for Astrid. Giovanni is a suave, grandiose character that's represented by a lion, and I think he's one of the more fascinating characters. Through his life, he cheated on Astrid numerous times, oh and that's God. actually something that we, the player, sees happen in real time in the game. And the player is also tasked with the choice of whether or not we tell Astrid. Either way, they break up in the game, Giovanni moves out into a lounge area, and then eventually asks to be taken to the Everdoor, and then Astrid after him. I want to preface this, um, Giovanni cheating on his partner is not okay and is a very bad thing to do to someone. It seriously hurt Astrid and it's disappointing and frustrating watching it all unfold. However, with as much as a ladies man that's cool and comic collected that he comes off as, his dialogue reveals how much of his personality has been shaped by the traumatic experiences that he had as a soldier in World War II. Peanut, open your eyes real big. This is a comet shower. Doesn't it look absolutely gorgeous? And it's only mildly dangerous. Yes, of course, you could lose a limb or two. But what is a wound in the face of such splendor? What is physical pain when you can have the thrill of your life? I know it sounds silly, but I've always loved a tricky situation. The lights, the sounds, the thrill. Gotta admit, it's pretty cool, isn't it? Running around, not knowing if you'll still be breathing the next minute. In the game, the minigame that Giovanni introduces you to is the Meteor Shower event. The minigame has one of my favorite soundtracks from the game. Hmm. It's playful and fun, but also has this sad, tragic undercurrent, which I think is a great representation of Giovanni as a character. Purposefully based on and inspired by the ephemeral look of sparklers and fireworks, the meteor event relates Giovanni's auditory perception and memory of fighting in World War II. The loud explosions put him on edge and drag old memories back to the surface, no matter how colorful or how beautiful the light show is. For Stella, catching the sparklers as they land before they vanish is an act of kindness and selflessness as she empathizes with Giovanni and understands the impact his trauma has on him. Before and after you play it, Giovanni tells you about how breathtaking and fun the meteor shower is, even though it's dangerous. It's also interesting to note that for many veterans, fireworks in particular can tr be a massive trigger for the sight and the sounds that they experienced when they were in combat. Giovanni actually does tell you about a time where a soldier had found a landmine and tragically died in his arms. Whether it's a result of survivor's guilt or maybe some other kind of trauma response, it's clear that this event had a huge impact on him. Life is fragile. Live it to the fullest while you can. As you take him to the Everdoor, Giovanni talks about how he has no regrets in life. Well, except for two things. One is leaving Astrid and the other is leaving you. And then he hits you with this line that just, oh. I know I shouldn't leave so soon. Believe me, I wish I could have stayed longer. And don't miss me too much, will you? I've never deserved you anyway. But I've loved you. And that won't stop me even if I'm not around anymore. The ones who really love you never really leave you, you know. Really stings for me right now. Giovanni as a character is probably the first character that you're gonna have mixed feelings on when you do escort him to the Everdoor. You might write him off altogether for being such a jerk to Astrid. But he's one of the most human characters in this game. He's charming, he's hurt, he's flawed, he's complex. His flower is a barrage star flower, which represents the courage he incarnated during the war in Stella's eyes. Alice is a very sweet but timid hedgehog whose passions, if you are lucky enough to get close enough for her to tell you, include fashion, travels, and Swedish romance novels. In life, Alice was the first patient of Stella's to die in her care, and actually affirmed Stella's choice to want to go into end-of-life care. Alice's minigame involves giving a much-needed break to a mother space pill bug, just roll with it. It involves a game of fetch with all of her rambunctious space buggy children. In her life, Alice was a devoted mother and wife, and here she's giving the mother pill bug a 
maybe the break that she so desperately deserved. In the game, Alice has some sort of maybe dementia or Alzheimer's, it's not entirely clear. Either way, watching the slow disintegration of her memory and her personality is absolutely heartbreaking to watch. Got my own little daffodil. Alice's spirit flower is a peace lily. Based on a team member's grandmother whose passing coincided with the beginning of Spirit Fair's production, we also wanted to address the pain of slowly losing a loved one through sickness and age. It's something most of us go through, often first via the loss of a grandparent, and Alice's departure was meant to evoke that experience, and hopefully offer catharsis. Peace lilies can bloom at low light and in crowded pots, a subdued flower that contents itself with little. It felt like an appropriate pick for Alice. In life, Atul was Stella's paternal uncle. He was a boisterous family man who ended up finding his calling being a union leader. He enjoyed teaching Stella all kinds of interesting things. He's much the same in the game, except he's a big huggable frog who likes playing the flute and likes feeling the rain on his skin. However, he harbors this underlying sorrow. There'll be times where seconds after happily eating whatever you shove in his gullet, he seems sad. Atul eats just about everything, but he has a real passion for gourmet food. He talks about his family often and how much he misses them. In fact, to kind of cheer him up because he's not feeling great, you put together a little family dinner of your own with some of the other passengers on board, and Atul is finally happy. And then he's gone. You, you wake, wake up and, and you find, find a spirit, spirit flower growing, growing in the place where you used to sleep. sleep. You don't get to say goodbye. In life, Atul disappeared during Stella's mid-twenties. It rocked her world significantly. It's part of the reason that the Stellartons ended up moving to North America. Atul was actually based off of somebody in the developer's life who also just disappeared. Although I think it's insinuated that he took his own life. Atul's disappearance could be interpreted a couple of different ways. My initial thought, and I think I read it this somewhere, was that Atul had chosen to take his own life. But since my first playthrough, I've come to realize that it doesn't really matter what the exact cause of it is. Whether it's by choice or by accident, whether it's taking your own life or heart attack or what have you. It's the sudden shock of the loss and just the total lack of closure. One minute they're here and then the next they're gone. A flash of lightning. The lightning storm has also been theorized to represent the storm of the mind. That is depression or other mental illness. Spirit flower is the white lily, which is meant to represent purity, which was something that Stella saw in all of Atoll's actions. Summer is a cute little garden snake and specifically a rosy boa. Just a little detail that'll make sense in a little bit. And she's a hippie child through and through. She grew up in a strict household and a Midwestern farm. She ended up becoming an agronomic engineer. No. I did not know what that word meant before playing this game. This led her to end up working with large farming corporations. It was there, after being exposed with chemicals and fumes, that she developed breast cancer. After developing breast cancer, she took a break. And that's where she met your Aunt Rose. Stella's Aunt Rose. Rose is the love of Summer's life. And it was that love that gave, her, gave Summer a new life. She developed an interest in biodynamic farming and really embraced her spiritual crystal vibration side. In life, Summer was a spiritual teacher for Stella. And in the game, she's much the same. She teaches you a song that makes your plants grow faster. She teaches you about meditation, the oneness and the wholeness. I hadn't given much thought to meditation before playing this game, and I was surprised that it was not the practice of emptying your mind. Summer and Rose lived a very long time happy together until Rose passed away. The loss sent Summer spiraling. She found it hard to take care of herself and her cancer came back, this time for good. She passed away with Stella by her side. Summer's spirit flower is an oxide daisy, which is supposed to represent patience and also among one of her most loved traits of her beloved Rose. Throughout Summer's storyline and the game, she talks about having these visions of Caesar. And indeed, that's the minigame that she introduces to you, where you're mining this corrupted ore. The sea dragon is what Summer sees as an incarnation of her fight with her cancer. The sea dragons are designed to look more like sea serpents in order to resemble Summer's spirit form. They give the impression that they are more closely related to her this way, while never even uttering a word during each apparition. Indeed. Part of Summer's journey was learning to accept that the dragon, the cancer, was a part of her. In the game, Gustav is represented by a red and brown owl. In life, Gustav is an art collector that Stella met while she was in Japan, and it's 
highly referenced or, or at least hint implied hinted that they had some sort of relationship. It's ambiguous as to whether she just had a crush on him or if they did end up having some sort of romantic relationship. At a young age, Gustave developed multiple sclerosis and it's implied that this is what ultimately led to his passing. The mini game that he introduces to Stella supports this. It's almost identical to Gwen's jellyfish game, except this time it's fireflies. For Gustav, the fireflies are a metaphor for the melodic buzzing he describes feeling to Stella. Intense sensations at each of his extremities that turn out to be multiple sclerosis. During flare-ups, Gustav would find comfort in listening to violin. He slowly would end up paralyzed and, inevitably, chair-bound. The visuals developed for the Jellyfish and the Fireflies event are the same but represent very different things for both Gwen and Gustav. They needed to feel overwhelming and to communicate fear, the darkness of the unknown. However, every Firefly and every Jellyfish still manages to have just the tiniest bit of light inside them, at times to represent hope and other times, life's silver linings. He is not a passenger that requires a lot of care. Rather, he wants Stella's help to organize one final exhibition, the one he dreamed about but couldn't realize during his life. While he may sometimes appear demanding and ungrateful, he never does anything for himself. The gallery he's building is for all to discover and enjoy. In a similar manner, his seemingly pedantic behavior hides a deep selflessness. He judges harshly because he believes that humanity should strive to leave a positive lasting mark. In his spirit form, Gustav adorns a red poppy, which is a symbol of pleasure, sacrifice, and remembrance. But lest you think that Gustav's a pretentious snob, understand that deep thought and art are what he devoted his entire life to. So as he was suffering with the pain of his body breaking down, that's ultimately what he turned to for comfort. Honestly, I could probably make an entire video about Gustav's final words themselves, but for now, I'll let him say it best. In the universe of chaos, humanity emerged, not a tiny bit more purposeful than the rest, but with an incredible faculty, that of creating meaning, however fleeting it might be. I have no inherent meaning, and neither do you, but we can create, organize, put in order, and thus create purpose and meaning, transcend the primordial chaos. Usefulness is an easy way to meaningfulness, but not a trustworthy one. It vanishes as quickly as we do, and so it seems the only hope humanity has for transcendence is through art. Meaningfulness pulled from our chaotic minds, not for our utility, but for its own sake. And after the artist has been long gone, turned to dust, our remains. And even after the last one of all humans, provided that we have protected it, art will remain. And so it is that art alone is left in our wake. Stanley. During my playthrough, I held on to Stanley for such a long time. He was next to, if not the last spirit that I escorted to the Everdor. In life, Stanley was Stella's youngest patient, an eight-year-old boy with a terminal illness that stuck with Stella long after he was gone. Stan is at first a seed fish from the sea. He then must be planted in the garden where he grows and is eventually plucked from the ground. As the youngest patient Stella ever had to take care of, Stan left an unforgettable imprint on her. He helped her realize that death can take many forms and that wisdom and peace of mind can be found in the most unusual patients. After claiming the guest house for himself, Stan builds himself a fort using the couch and tables. Jacob, his beloved and magical pet beetle, occupies a place of honor in his room. Do you think my mom will be disappointed in me? Disappointed that I had to go? I tried. I really tried. But I don't think I did it. I like it when I win, but <laughs> I couldn't this time. I think it's okay. It's okay to lose, sometimes. I'm really trying to be brave, but I'm, I'm really scared. 
I've hoped so much that this was just a nightmare. This is a nightmare. Why can't I wake up? I wanted to wake up, but it never worked. I never woke up. And it all felt so real. You take care of Jacob, okay? Jacob is a good beetle. And he was my friend. I feel strange. I feel cold. I wish Mom was here. And Dad. But you are here. Big Cat, I hope it's like falling asleep. I don't really have anything to add about Stanley because I am just, I'm already just profoundly sad. The farewell edition of Spirit Fair introduces three new characters, two of which are found on the island of Overbrook. The lore behind it is that it was part of Stella's nursing education, that she had to complete an internship and that was where she was placed. It was there that she met an orderly named Jackie and a patient named Daria. Overbrook is ultimately totally optional, but should you decide to do the many errands and tasks that are on that island, you will slowly but surely see the island as a whole just improve, showing how much something can change for the better when somebody who cares is in charge. The characters like the island itself is not necessary to progress the game, but I did really enjoy watching the story of Jackie and Daria progress. Because of the verbose and complex way that Daria speaks, it can be hard to kind of understand what all is going on with her. In fact, that's kind of the point. Because she's so difficult to understand, it would be easy to just skip through her mountains of text and write her off altogether the way that everybody else in the world has. So Daria's backstory. She developed multiple mental issues, including sound to color synesthesia, which is where you can see sound as colors. And she also mentioned starting to hear things that no one else could. That created a rift between her and her family. That was how she ended up in a mental hospital where apparently some orderlies would use harsh methods to keep her restrained. She wishes she had a healthy and normal connection to her family, but after all of the experiences that she's gone through, she believes that she as a person doesn't exist anymore, that she is just scraps of a person. She has large, gaps in her memory and sometimes goes into full-blown catatonia. Her mini game is The Mind Palace, which is, again, one of my favorite songs from the OST. You can't go wrong with really any of them, but this one is very interesting. And the mini game itself is beautiful and fascinating, and it's how we start to kind of learn more about Daria in her own way. Daria's spirit flower is the saffron crocus, which is associated with creativity, invention, sexuality, love, and death. Moving on to Jackie. Jackie is represented by a hyena, and while he does initially come off as a jokester, it becomes clear to the player that he is struggling with some, with some deep feelings. Feelings of being underappreciated, feelings of anger, feelings of self-loathing. He sometimes blows up Stella's phone for attention and help, and in the game and life, he has some sort of altercation with Daria that results in him being fired. After he's fired from the hospital, he actually sneaks onto your boat as a stowaway. When you eventually end up building him his house slash room, 
He has his mind set on self-improvement. He wants to get better and be a better person. But Jackie has a lot of struggles. He struggles with his past, with his relationship with his family, with not having great memories of his past. He struggles with his actions and it's, overall, he is at war with himself. After trying through different items that he requests to improve himself, he eventually asks to be taken to the Everdor as he has given up on himself and he believes that it would be better off for everybody if he was not around in general. On the way to the Everdor in the boat, he kind of muses on what he hopes this the next place is going to be like, a place that he misremembers as Shoal. Shoal, I remember that. Everybody's equal and there's no comfort. Doesn't mean it's uncomfortable. There's just nothing. Nothing good and nothing bad. You're just shielded from light and from judgment. The dead go there to be forgotten by the living. But they also forget and then turn to dust until there's nothing left, just dust and forgetfulness everywhere and forever. Really referring to is from the Hebrew Bible and it's called Sheol. And it's the place that ordinary souls go after after they die. When you get back to the boat, you can go into his room. And if you so choose, you might be able to snoop around and find three pieces of crumpled up paper. They're letters of apology to Daria that he never finished. His stance on Sheol makes sense then. He couldn't find the words to apologize to Daria, perhaps because he didn't think that she would forgive him, but more likely, he didn't forgive himself. Can you imagine that, Stella? Dust and forgetfulness? <laughs> what a thought. Yeah, okay, we're there. I uh, just... Yeah, bring it in. See you on the other side, Stellars. <laughs> or not. In life after he was fired from the incident with Daria, he lived with Stella for a little bit. The true extent of his self-loathing became clear to Stella, and it is implied that he ended his life by walking into traffic shortly after. Jackie's flower, the Red Dahlia, is a symbol of power, sanguinity, and inner strength. It is also, however, a symbol of dishonesty, betrayal, and instability. Jackie struggled with these two sides of himself and ultimately lost the battle. Between his clingy texts and his rage-filled outbursts, he could be hard to like. But as you get to know him and as you start to understand the damage that made him who he is, and it is just such a bitter feeling watching him leave and give up on himself before he can complete this journey of self-improvement that he so clearly wanted. Compared to the other characters, Beverly as a character to me was uh, seemed rushed and not very impactful. I got Beverly shortly after losing Alice, which is just a, just a hard hitting loss to see somebody go through that. In life, Beverly was one of Stella's neighbors when she was living in Toronto. If I do have a gripe with Spirit Bearer, it's that there are a couple of things in the game that just seem really rushed or incomplete. And I get it to an extent, right? Like you're working with a small team, it's a pretty ambitious game and you have to get it done at some point. There are some things that are just not gonna be complete. It felt to me that the further on in the game that I went, the more I noticed the things that weren't complete. For an example, two of them were gameplay mechanics. There was one, meditation. During the meditation scene with Summer, she mentions something about visions. Visions is something that pops up a couple of times and apparently you, the spirit bearer, are supposed to have a vision, but nothing happens. <laughs> You're actually, Summer encourages you to find these sacred or consecrated trees out and out and about in the world. And they exist, they're out there. They just don't do anything. <laughs> Another game mechanic is electricity. There's this one locked area in the bottom line corporation block where it has something to do with electricity and an electric panel, and you never get to know what that is. <laughs> There's also lighthouses that are all around the map. And while they do have something to do with Buck, ultimately I feel like it was just, it was a mechanic or a part of a story that just wasn't fully explored. Because the owl, Hades, is represented by this purple fog that exists in some of the mini games, I imagine that the electricity aspect, especially when combined with the lighthouses, was perhaps some sort of metaphor or um, something about 
finding the light and, and, and getting over the fear of death, perhaps. Whatever the intention, it's disappointing that these mechanics are still in the game, but not playable. Beverly also feels like a rushed, incomplete character. Beverly's spirit flower is the red anemone, which is powerful association of death and the act of forsaken love in Greek myths. Also, the way that she eats irritates the bejesus out of me. Ugh. And that's all I have to say about her. Elena. I actually finished this script and it was only when I was getting ready that I realized I totally skipped over Elena. So she's not a bonus character. You need her to complete the game, but yeah. Elena was one of the last patients that Stella had and she's represented by a greyhound. In life, she was a strict teacher and she carries that over into the game. If you hug her, her mood will actually decrease because she can't stand it. She's very blunt. Elena's spirit flower is actually a tree. It's the cypress, which apparently is supposed to represent dread and death in many cultures. And Elena is the only spirit who willingly accepts death as a simple moment without hesitation. By the time we got to her, I was just so tired. Um, it was actually a refreshing change to have a character that I was not so attached to and wasn't so sad when they left. Buck. Buck is another interesting character and he's the only character, the second character that you are not allowed to take to the Everdor, but for different reasons. Before you bring Gwen to the Everdor, you might look up at the sky and notice that there's a constellation that's already there. That constellation is for Buck because Stella never knew him in life. Buck was her sister Lily's best friend and he passed away. So Stella grew up hearing stories about him and it was his love of RPG tabletop kind of games that got Stella into it. Buck is represented by a creature. Buck is the last spirit on your boat and if you choose to continue interacting with him when all when everyone else is gone, you can go on cute little treasure hunts with him and his mini game involves um, destroying these cardboard orcs. Inspired by our creative director's teenage friend who died at the young age of 18, Buck is an intriguing character and the only spirit who takes the form of a mythical creature, a basilisk with a petrifying gaze. Buck has already taken his final form when found by Stella. Buck was her sister Lily's friend who died in his teenage years. Stella remembers Lily's recounting of many of Buck's after his death. Sorry to break it to you, but I don't think there's more to it. Listen, I really don't want to push you towards it. Frack no, but you know, I think you should try accepting your fate. Funny thing, I don't even know if I accepted it myself. My presence here might give us a clue. Adorned with rue flowers, Buck bears the burden of sorrow and regret. His life was never fully lived, and it was never really within his grasp to do so. He also has something to do with the lighthouses, but eh, that part of the game, I think, was just not really fleshed out. Ah, yes, the scary fog bird. In the art book, he's referred to as Hades, and he's the bird that you meet three times before the end of the game. The art book actually explains this pretty well. Being a central figure in the dreamlike reconstruction of the Greek underworld Stella envisions, Hades both represents death itself, inescapable and unavoidable, but also Stella's own psyche as she engages in an inner dialogue with them during her final moments. Am I less daunting to you now? Or am I still a ghastly shadow, deafening absence? Remember, when your body failed, you knew. You'd seen it a thousand times. You knew I would come. You fought valiantly, yet suffered all the same. I was deep within your heart, as I had always been. In your final moments, you accepted my call. You slowly draw your last breath. <sighs> and here we are. You know this is the end. They speak in their voice, yet say Stella's own words as she is facing her own end. For a long time called internally the Mist Garden, Hades controls mists in the world of Spiritfarer. Mist being always linked to death, its proximity and the fear of it. The dark purple mist surrounding jellyfish, fireflies, and the dragon are all Hades in his most fearful form. 
The white mist the guardian owl is made of, as well as the mist surrounding islands at the edge of the world, are synonymous with how close death is and how inevitable it is. All right, home stretch. Now that we understand these different characters and their places within Stella's life, I think now we can fully appreciate her story. Stella is a bright, optimistic person who has a real gift for being there for the people around her. She has a sister, Lily, and two unnamed parents. Stella and her family moved to northeastern France when she was a little girl, which is represented by the Hummingbird region. She had a best friend named Gwen and spent a lot of time with her uncle, Atul. And after her uncle went missing, Stella and Lily watched the slow decline of their father as he lost his battle with cancer. Stella herself became a palliative nurse, a gentle end-of-life companion that eased the pain of her patients. And perhaps cruel irony, Stella, who helped so many patients through the end of their terminal cancers, is herself diagnosed with an aggressive cancer. The game itself could be the afterlife, but is more likely Stella's comatose mind putting the pieces of her life together before she dies. We see her sister Lily only appear at night and appear as a swarm of butterflies with a Barella flower, which has long since symbolized love and devotion. She is here holding your hand. Go now. You are not alone. We hear her sister Lily talking to Stella in this comatose state. Do you remember that phone call you gave me last year? You had taken a sabbatical from work. I had to call the center to learn about it. Yeah, she took a couple months off. She's got some bad news. What a weird way to learn your sister isn't doing well. So you call me two weeks or something after. It's maybe two in the morning here. Your breath was shaking. I could hear you breathing heavily. You start talking about the trees around you and the air. No. Hi, Lily. No, I'm not doing well. Nothing. Just talking about the trees and the air. You said it was cold. That it felt like death, even over here. I didn't even know where here was. I was scared. You came back and told mom and me of your diagnosis. And now we're here together. If you can hear me, I love you so much, sis. You're not alone in the woods anymore. We're here, Stella. You'll never be alone. You've never been alone. With her purpose fulfilled, Stella and her companion her beloved family cat, Daffodil, go to the Everdoor and depart. that's the end. Stella's story is absolutely powerful and poignant. And even though there were a lot of tears, I really enjoyed playing this game the first time around. I actually had started it again for this video a while ago. Um, and then my, my biological father died. Because life loves a theme, right? My relationship with him was complicated and sad sometimes. He definitely had those internalized wars that he was always fighting against. But he would always try to help people. He was actually a nurse for a large part of his life. And he always had this dream of getting back into the field when some circumstances of his changed. He always saw himself as a nurse. But most likely because of the mental health stigma of the previous generations, he never really got the help that he needed. But things were looking up. And in fact, he seemed to be doing a lot better. But then he suddenly died. Heart attack. I didn't get to say goodbye. I did really enjoy playing the game, um, but I have really been struggling with it the second time around. In fact, I ended up just not being able to finish it for this video. There, there were things that I took away from it the first time I played that have been helpful for me with grieving and with processing, 
and I know that if and when I play this game again, I'll be able to take more from it and really appreciate it. Um, but the wound of the wound of losing him is just too fresh right now. There is this one part of the game though that really resonates. So like there's this game mechanic where if you need to, you know, make some more space or get some more resources, um, you can salvage a room, right? You can, it disappears off the map and you get the parts of it. And something I didn't know until I had said goodbye to most of my passengers is that once you build a passenger's room, you can't salvage it. It's on your boat forever. And even though life goes on, because there's still so much to do, lots of chores, things to see, um, you start to feel, as more and more of your passengers leave, you start to feel lonely. And your boat feels empty, but in the worst way possible. Because it's not barren. Even though the person or the, the passenger that you knew is gone, you're still surrounded by all of their things. Reminders of everything that they were, everything they wanted to be. Reminders of everything that you've lost. It's all you have of them now. That and your memory. But even your memory starts to feel lonely and sad. Because all, all the pieces of your life that you shared with this person or passenger, still in you, but nobody knows or understands. You're left with half of a private conversation. And it's kind of like seeing a shooting star that everybody else misses. I feel it sometimes with like tension in my chest or my throat will get really tight. And I know at some point, right, the tension will ease and I'll be able to think about and feel the love that I had for him. And I'll be, look, be able to look back at all the times that I had with him with joy while also not washing over his flaws or the reality of our relationship or th the would-haves and what could have been. I hope at that point, I'll know how to say goodbye. Because here, in the immediate aftermath, it's just pain. <laughs>